Hello. Um, thank you for that, uh, for that welcome. Very nice to be back here at 5, uh, five by 15 on uh, their birthday. Absolutely terrific. Um, so, uh, yes, 10 years ago. This book was published 10 years ago. That's a, that's a long time ago. I better warn you, by the way, there are, there's uh, a couple of clips here, uh, one of which is um, very violent and one which has a violent image, so I'll give a, a warning before it happens. Um, but anyway, so uh, 10 years ago, this um, uh, book was published. And it was published because I was working in Yugoslavia um, during the wars in the former Yugoslavia, and I noticed that a lot of the militias were involved in organized crime of one sort or another, and so I started mapping uh, what their relationships were with other countries in the world. And eventually, I identified as I was writing the book that there were two main reasons for the very rapid globalization of organized crime um, uh, in the world after uh, 1989. And the first reason was uh, part of Mrs. Thatcher's strategy of the Big Bang, which was the uh, freeing up of controls on current and financial accounts so that uh, people could move vast sums of money from territory to territory without it really being monitored by anyone. And the second one was the uh, collapse of communism. And so after 1989 and 1990, for a certain period of time, there was a huge lawless area stretching from the Chinese border in the east to the Slovene, Austrian and Slovene Italian border in the west where the state was n not capable of uh, basically um, uh, monitoring economic activity as we saw this huge change from planned economies to uh, market economies. And when that happens, when the state's unable to uh, monitor commercial transactions and things like that, what you get is the emergence of what, uh, of what sociologists call privatized law enforcement agencies. We call them the mafia. And uh, this basically grew up all over, the, uh, all over the world. And I thought, well, this is absolutely fascinating. I must find out more about it. So I decided to go around the world. I wrote a book proposal. And I uh, go around the world. And uh, the, the basis of McMafia is interviews that I undertook with people involved in organized crime. And uh, so I would uh, interview gun runners, I interviewed drug dealers, I interviewed people smugglers, I interviewed money launderers, the whole lot. And uh, of course, uh, when it came to um, uh, you know, interviews for the book and things like that, and indeed with all, uh, people all over the place, the one question that people always ask me when, when they're asking me about writing the book, they say, they say was it dangerous? To which I say, of course it was bloody dangerous. <laughs> I was talking to a bunch of criminals, for God's sake, and they were all very violent. It was extremely dangerous. Um, but as you're an author, as opposed to a television maker or something like that, you have a sort of professorial aspect to you, which um, they quite enjoy. And uh, I would always ask them, the first thing I would ask them is, is where, where were you born? What did your parents do? Um, where did you go to school? And how did you get into the business? I never referred to it as organized crime. I always referred to it as the global shadow economy. And, uh, <laughs> and um, they were all pretty uh, helpful about it. But you can't just ring up you know, a Mumbai assassin and say, fancy going for a cup of coffee and revealing the secrets of your trade. So it would take me a very long time to organize these interviews, months and months and months. Uh, sometimes I got lucky and, and uh, met people in, in South Africa. I met somebody by chance who took me into uh, the Stellenbosch township at 11 o'clock at night, breaking all the rules. And uh, I met a, a bunch of guys who were involved in uh, marijuana dealing there, and they were extremely in instructive. That was pure chance, but most of the time, I would have to send faxes, send letters, explain who I was, what I was doing. It was actually quite a bureaucratic experience in a weird sort of, weird sort of way. 
Um, but uh, once, you, once you met them and got to know them and they realized that you weren't going to accuse them of being a mass murderer or whatever, they would be surprisingly uh, talkative. And one of the people who I talked to at great length was a man named Emil Kulev, who's a Bulgarian, who the US State Department described as uh, Bulgaria's money launderer in chief. Um, but he was incredibly helpful for me uh, in explaining how a small group of gangsters and oligarchs seized control of the Bulgarian economy in the space of about three or four years after the collapse of communism there. Um, Two months after I'd spent uh, a couple of days uh, with him, uh, unfortunately, and here's uh, uh, one image that people might not like, um, he was driving on his way to work, and uh, he took 37 bullets to his car, and there is Emil Kulev uh, just down there. And there was a sort of um, uncanny thing about the, uh, the interviews that I was doing, is, is that about 50% of the people who I interviewed are now dead and uh, some of them very soon after, but it was not, I hasten to add, uh, related to the, uh, the book. Um, I did get warnings from the Montenegrins and the Bulgarians. I, it was suggested to me that I didn't visit Montenegro and Bulgaria after the book was, uh, was published. I took those suggestions at face value, and I didn't go there for about eight years or so, but I've been back there since, and I was, I was fine. But I was unnerved. I was unnerved when I met representatives of the FARC um, in the jungle outside of, uh, outside of Cali uh, because, uh, you know, one of their stock in trade is, is kidnapping journalists and keeping them in the jungle for about five or six years. But I was lucky. I got away with that. I was unnerved when I met a uh, Canadian marijuana smuggler who smuggled industrial quantities of, of, of marijuana. And... Um, he introduced me to his hunting dog, and he says, he says, this is my dog, he says, he says, he can, he can kill a black bear in about 30 seconds. He said, it's a lot quicker when it comes to humans. And then he smiled at me, <laughs> and I was extremely polite. And uh, so you would get occasional moments where you uh, felt slightly weird, but on the whole, um, it was uh, absolutely fine. Now, it's 10 years ago, and uh, the, the book actually has had three or four iterations as a possible film or, or television show. But what was really important to me when I was approached by the uh, chief writer and the director of McMafia, Hossamini and James Watkins, respectively, is, is that they clearly wanted to focus on the authenticity of, of the book and replicating that authenticity in the television series. Now, some people have suggested that the, that the series is outlandish and unreal. And uh, all I can say is, is that, um, first of all, parts of it are taken directly from the book, and I can te testify to the veracity of what happened there. Uh, but also, most of what you see is an amalgam of various crimes and various processes which I have, uh, uh, I have uh, researched, and there's nothing uh, really inauthentic about it at all. If anything, strangely, what uh, people complained about, first of all, with the first episode, was that it was too slow. So they said, oh, this is, this is what well, you're watching the Twitter feed. That's everyone saying, this is very boring, very slow. But then we started getting people complaining that the show was too violent and there was too much action. So, you know, it pays your money. Um, but uh, there was a reason why, why Hoss uh, and James did that. And that is because in the real world of uh, organized crime, um, you don't like to use violence. You avoid using violence if you possibly can, because if you use violence, it attracts heat, it attracts police attention, politicians, the media, public outrage. But, uh, the, and the other thing, of course, is, is you, you risk losing your most valuable resource, which is your human muscle. Um, but if you are going to use violence, then it has to be decisive, 
And it has to do two things. It has to get rid of the problem, which is the killing of Uncle Boris in that clip. But it also has to send out a message to everyone else you know that when you use violence, you succeed and you solve problems because that will um, make them uh, less inclined to your competitors or the police to confront you. So as a consequence of that, in serious organized crime outfits, much more frequently than using violence is using the threat of violence. So if you can project a credible threat of violence, you can do the job without risking your, your muscle and without attracting heat. Threat is always a preferable uh, option. Now, of course, one of the things we wanted to do was to show the sort of front line of organized crime, the, the, the very sort of dark side and the way that it affects victims, in particular the story about women being, women being trafficked from Russia into Israel via Egypt, where we incidentally, of course, we have uh, Orthodox Christian gangsters, we have Muslim gangsters, and we have Jewish gangsters who work seamlessly across borders and across confessional divides. But the other thing we wanted to do is to contrast something like that with the key issue around which all of this resolves, revolves, and that is the laundering of money. Money laundering is at the very heart of this huge business, which is now worth about 15% of the global economy, but it has a much bigger impact because of its ability to corrupt political systems. So these are ideas we wanted to get across in a dramatic fashion, and Hoss and James decided at the very beginning, I think quite sensibly, to go straight to the heart of the, money, uh, the matter of money laundering and show how it is done across the world and how the bankers are far removed from the consequences of their activity. That money laundering is, is why McMafia, 10 years after the book was published, is actually, to my mind, and this is not just because I wrote it, but to my mind it's still uh, very relevant because the McMafia culture has grown since it was published. Uh, it has now deeply infected the United States of uh, President Trump. It's deeply affected Erdogan's Turkey, Putin's Russia, Zuma in, in South Africa. Many, many countries around the world are seeing crime and corruption coming together. Um, and I want to stress that political corruption is an essential part of organized crime, <clears throat> as is the inequality which continues to grow, economic in inequality within countries uh, and between countries. So uh, what the book tries to do is to explain how we got into that mess in the first place. But I would like to end up on a positive note by saying the fight back has begun. So although we know that crime and corruption is incredibly powerful in this world, we have also seen an immense movement, whether it's through law enforcement agencies like the Department of Justice using the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, to bring to book corporations in the United States that use corruption outside of the US, whether it's NGOs like Global Witness or Transparency International, whether it's the lawyers in Brazil who have started with the uh, investigation into the car wash scandal, uh, judicial assault on what is the biggest corruption scandal in history, bar none in financial terms, People are saying we have had enough of political corruption and we have enough, we've had enough about, about crime. And at the heart of everything, strangely enough, is London. Um, so what you see here is you see, uh, this is an uh, online thing which shows us um, which boroughs have the most properties purchased by entities from tax havens who do not, under current legislation, have to say who they are or how they got this money in the first place. I'll see if my um, mouse works, but the mouse is, of course, not working very well, unfortunately. That's not working, but I will tell you exactly what it says. In Camden, we have 2,222 properties. This is number three, which have been purchased by entities whose owners we know nothing about in the 
uh, from, uh, from tax havens. In Kensington and Chelsea, in at number two, unsurprisingly, with 5,162 properties that have been purchased by people about whom we know nothing or where their money comes from. And number one, far out in the lead, a round of applause, please, for Westminster with over 10,000 properties. 10,000 properties which are the consequence of laundered money. Now, we are waiting to see whether the House of Commons is about to pass legislation which will demand for the first time that people who buy property in the city and, and jack up the prices for all the rest of us and uh, do not pay taxes here, do not pay many taxes on their properties, often leave their bills unpaid and, and so on, whether they will finally have to admit who they are and we will be able to see which corrupt politicians and which gangsters are using this city to launder their money. It's taken a long time for the United Kingdom government to have done something about this. I hope it's going to happen uh, in the next uh, few months and we should see some announcements about that in the next week or so. But this is a major issue we're facing with organized crime and political corruption, but we can do things um, uh, about it by standing up and demanding of our MPs that they pass legislation like this and that together we can put a stop to the roller coaster of people like Trump and Putin infecting our world with criminality and corruption. Thank you very much.